Well, more times than not, I come on here and every single time with these B-level pay-per-views, or in this case, a D-level pay-per-view, this may very well be an F-level pay-per-view for the WWE on Sunday, but more times than not, I come on here and I express that there's a pay-per-view and you guys probably don't even realize it until I mention it, that there's a pay-per-view on Sunday night, in this case, it's the Elimination Chamber on the road to WrestleMania, if you might not be aware. Now, we all know that WWE doesn't have any plans going into the Elimination Chamber. If you think that they do, you're a fool. You're kidding yourself. Wait till you see what WWE's got planned for the Elimination Chamber on Sunday. Wait till you see what they got planned for WrestleMania in April, folks. Here's a little spoiler for you. It ain't looking too good. And everything that I complained about over the last several weeks is becoming a factual reality. It's going to be a good one. Also, Bruce Pritchard has a new initiative backstage. This guy does everything but write shows. Initiative this, initiative that, keeping secrets from the writing team. This guy always has a new practice backstage, but write the shows. Good ones at that. Bruce Pritchard has a new practice keeping even more writers in the dark backstage. I got news on Aleister Black and Andrade. Where are they? Your guess is as good as mine. Titus, I'm sure, is feeding them well, but I got news on where they are. WWE, are they planning Shane McMahon versus Braun Strowman at WrestleMania 37? And Keith Lee. If you thought he was buried before, wait till you get a load of this one. Vince McMahon sees absolutely nothing in limited Keith Lee. I wonder why. We're going to go over all of this stuff right here on episode 365 of Off The Scripts. This video is brought to you by CatBeast.com. Design your own custom snapbacks and hats. going on guys thank you so very much for joining me right here on off the script this is episode 365 for your saturday february 20th 2021 we are looking at the elimination chamber on sunday night i will be live right here on youtube with all of the fun and festivities and i will be live as always breaking it down like you deserve like you deserve, like I can only do it every single time there's a major pay-per-view. There's nobody better. And there's no place you would rather be on your Sunday night than watching me talk about how garbage the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view really was. So make sure you guys set your notifications. It's going to be a good one. Man, I don't know how much more ranting I could possibly do when it comes to WrestleMania. It, it, really, it really irks the shit out of me that People in the community are really this dumb. The community as a whole are a bunch of fucking idiots. And I mean that with every fiber of my soul. I mean that wholeheartedly, man. Now, not you guys, obviously, because if you're listening to me, you're one of the good ones. You're one of the bright ones. You're one of the smart ones. You're one of the ones that gets it. That gets it. But the Elimination Chamber could have been done so much better than what WWE has already given us on television. There's no match card. There's no match card at all. You're going into it blind. I don't know who thinks that's a good idea, but WWE has only two matches set up for the Elimination Chamber. Now, I'm recording this before SmackDown. They could obviously add matches coming out of Friday Night SmackDown, but whatever they are going to add to the pay-per-view on Sunday night really isn't going to matter because... It's not important. None of it is important. 
The chamber isn't important. The titles that are being defended at the chamber, they're not changing hands. None of it is important. We're not finding out who's challenging Roman Reigns for the universal title. We're not challenging Drew McIntyre for the WWE title at WrestleMania. There's nothing going on. There's nothing coming out of that show that is going to be newsworthy because of the creative direction that they've opted to take going into the chamber and then obviously coming out. It's awful. It really is awful, man, and it, it it just irks the shit out of me that fans are so complacent with everything that's going on. There's not one single thing that they want to complain about as if complaining is bad. It's unreal to me, man. Latest progress on the chamber. Reason why WWE changed original plans for the top elimination chamber match on Sunday's card. I got a follow-up to the story on WWE and the producers and the creative and the commentary people that were promised raises and bonuses for WWE last year that they always get around WrestleMania season how the workflow fell apart due to all the anger about not getting those particular raises and bonuses. Got news on Bruce Pritchard. It wouldn't be an off the script if I don't have news on Bruce fucking Pritchard, man. And WWE has yet to decide on plans for Drew McIntyre at WrestleMania, folks. Listen to this. WWE has plans for Bad Bunny. And they don't have plans for Drew McIntyre at WrestleMania. (laughs) If you find that to be okay, man, Jesus Christ, your social media card should be fucking revoked. Oh, my God. So we're going to go over that as well on the podcast today, man. Strap yourselves in. It's going to be a good one. I got a first look. This has nothing to do with WWE, but I got a first look at what is coming. I'm doing a complete channel rebranding around WrestleMania time. I may unveil it before WrestleMania because I'm so excited. I can't wait to show everybody what's going on. We're going to have a new intro. We're going to have a new outro for the live streams. I am contemplating getting a new intro intro done with legionary music as you guys come to familiarize yourself with. Everything's being redone. The layout that you see here, completely going to be something new, man. We are taking it to the next level, a level that absolutely nobody is going to be able to duplicate. I got a first look at what's coming with the intro and the outro, man. And when you see it, You guys are going to be blown away at what you are watching. You're going to be seeing the evolution of the podcast right before your very eyes, man. I can't wait. I can't wait. If I was to describe it to you, if you guys are familiar with Dr. Disrespect in the gaming realm, he's got his live streams on YouTube every single Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And if you guys see his intro, to his live streams, gas station, the Ferrari outside, and just that Dr. Disrespect vibe. This is on level with that. In fact, what I saw is better than what he does. That's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say, man. It is so OTS, you're going to be mesmerized when you see it. Get on board now. It's going to be great. Can't wait to show you guys what's coming up. We got some new sponsors lined up as well. I will be unveiling them on Sunday during the pay-per-view. I want to thank everybody that shows your continued support for the podcast. We are doing big things, man. I I told you 2021 was going to be my year, and I'm making it happen. CNC, we're about to get that episode one rolled out. Should be good. Can't wait to show you guys what me and Big Hodge have been working on. As of today, we are filming the last couple of shows that we had in mind for the CNC. So as you guys watch this, we are in Manhattan somewhere filming the CNC. Should be great. Can't wait to show you guys what we have recorded so far for that. It's going to be great. A nice 
classy twist on wrestling discussion, man. Can't wait to show you guys. But we got a lot of stuff coming up. I don't want to waste any more of your time. At JD from NY206 on Twitter and on Instagram. I'm making it a mental note to be on Instagram a little bit more than I have been in previous years. I just let it kind of fall by the wayside because I'm not really a, a guy that takes pictures of himself. I'm not some fucking thought on social media who likes to post selfies and get thousands upon thousands of likes, but then you have no fucking charisma or personality. That's not me, man. I'm not very photogenic. I don't like taking pictures of myself. I don't really like diving into my personal life, but I want to be a little bit more active on Instagram. So if you guys want to follow me on Instagram, I'd love to get to 10,000 followers before we get to WrestleMania. So if you guys got an IG, go and follow me. If you guys are on Twitter and have a, a Twitter account, at JD from NY206 is the place on both IG and the little bluebird. Make sure you guys go and check out Patreon, patreon.com slash JD from NY206. Great way to support the show. As always, we got the beer mugs. We got the t-shirts. We got some people getting there. Are we live? T-shirts in the mail. Good to hear. Make sure you guys go and check that out if you want to support the show. Bonfire is the exclusive home for Off the Script t-shirts. JD is Negan and all the Off the Script designs that are there. I need a really, really new... Just captivating t-shirt, man. I don't know what to put up for WrestleMania season, but we'll see if we can come up with something. But if you guys want some of the older designs, they are still there, available for sale, bonfire.com. Get your masks, mouthmasker.com slash OTS. Make sure you guys go and check out all the, all the other videos that you might have missed on the channel. we got a ton of stuff coming up. But if you missed anything during the week, Monday Night Raw, Friday Night SmackDown, and AEW Dynamite Live, those are on the channel right now, so go and check all that stuff out. If you want to hit that subscribe button, I would greatly appreciate it. Let's try for 121,000. We're nearly there. Appreciate you guys very much. I know we're going to get it, but I would rather speed up the process. So make sure you guys hit that subscribe button. Hit the thumbs up, as always. Helps out the video. Helps me out. Helps you out. Helps everybody out. Shows YouTube that people are watching and are interested in the video, man. It basically is promoting the channel by turning that thumbs up button blue. It's a great deal. And today's show is sponsored by the one and the only, The Ridge. I got myself a new Ridge wallet, man. I had to go out and get it. Had to go out and get it, man. I had to go out and get the Damascus Ridge wallet. I'll be showing it off today on the podcast. You guys can save 10% off by putting in the code SCRIPTS10 at checkout. That's SCRIPT10 at checkout for 10% off. That is ridge.com slash SCRIPT10. And you are going to use code SCRIPT10 at checkout to save some money. Uh, not only wallets, man, they got knives, they got backpacks, they got commuter charging blocks and phone chargers and all that stuff, man. Really, really, really great stuff to streamline your life, and make it easier every single day. Ridge.com slash script 10. Want to start off at the top, man. Let's start off with the elimination chamber. The WWE should really think about eliminating the elimination chamber match because it has been just brought down to basically nothing. It is unimportant. It doesn't even factor into the road to WrestleMania, and that's why... It has existed for all these years. It's been the pay-per-view to get everybody primed and ready for WrestleMania season. And this year, WWE is doing nothing to enhance WrestleMania by way of the Elimination Chamber. The Elimination Chamber is this Sunday. You might not know that because either A, you're not watching the product because it's fucking garbage, or B, you don't watch WWE at all. You've opted to go watch AEW or Impact or Ring of Honor or MLW. Yet you still watch wrestling, but you don't watch WWE. Either one of those answers would suffice. Some people don't watch WWE at all, but they keep up with it. You might not watch it, period, because it just sucks, like I said. So the latest progress on the Elimination Chamber card for this Sunday, WWE has no plans. They have changes now being instituted for the show. If you guys watch Monday Night Raw, which, I mean, I don't know who the fuck is watching Monday Night Raw. I don't know who's watching Raw, man. 
Lacey Evans announced that she's actually pregnant. That caused WWE to pull her from the scheduled Raw Women's title match. And also, Keith Lee and his status is in question right now. I don't know what that means or what happened with Keith Lee, but he disappeared, came back, and now disappeared again. Maybe Vince McMahon finally realized that he is what I've been saying he is, limited Keith Lee. But it's not Keith Lee's fault. Some of it might be Keith Lee's fault, but most of it is Vince McMahon and Bruce Pritchard's fault. Ringside News has learned that as of early this week, WWE was still trying to work out what to do with the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view. This really isn't anything out of the ordinary when it comes to touching up a card, but this situation is still a bit unique, they say. Now, they spoke with a tenured writer with direct knowledge of this particular situation, and they confirmed that, and I quote, yes, Elimination Chamber is still a work in progress, but isn't everything until it airs on television with WWE, end quote. I love the mentality in WWE, man. Everything's a work in progress, but isn't everything until it airs on TV? Does nobody know how to plan? Does nobody have long-term vision in this company? Do Vince McMahon and Bruce Pritchard just love to come to work? With no solid plan, they would they would rather just facilitate everything in the moment, on the fly. You would realize that coming to work and having things laid out for you and a plan and a vision in place, it would make everybody's workflow a lot easier. It would make everybody's job a lot more enjoyable. I guess that's not the way of WWE. The two Elimination Chamber matches will seemingly remain untouched at this point. And Roman Reigns will face the winner of the SmackDown Chamber match in the very same evening. Other than that, WWE has nothing planned for the show. It's all up in the air. I don't know why we even have an Elimination Chamber pay-per-view on Sunday night if this is the direction that WWE is going in. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this. You guys know how I feel about this. I'm going to say it again just for the people in the back that refuse to fucking listen to me. WWE, they should have taken the Elimination Chamber and they should have used it, the Chamber, to determine a champion's challenger at WrestleMania. Now, I'm going to use this as an example. If Edge wins the Royal Rumble, which in this case, he won the Royal Rumble, right? WWE is somehow prolonging Edge by choosing his opponents or not choosing his opponent, I should say. Prolonging Edge, not choosing his opponent for WrestleMania. They have him showing up on Monday Night Raw. They have him showing up on NXT. They have him showing up on SmackDown in hopes that WWE fans are going to be like, oh man, this is a great story. Look at the effort that WWE is putting into it. Look at all the unpredictability. Look at the the story that they're developing here with Edge coming out of the Royal Rumble. Meanwhile, ratings are down. Ratings are right back to where they were with Monday Night Raw and SmackDown. They're both down. There's absolutely no interest coming out of Monday Night and Friday Night shows. Nobody's watching this program for Edge. All you're doing at this point is pissing people off. Edge is not a ratings factor. He was never a ratings draw. He's not a ratings draw then. He's not a ratings draw now. So what are we prolonging? All the prolonging that you've done already with him winning the Royal Rumble and not announcing his opponent is actually fucking up creative because not only do we not know what WWE is doing or what they want to do, WWE themselves don't know what the fuck they want to do. Now, get this, folks. Get this geek in the back who refuses to listen to the fucking Messiah. Okay? This is my realm. There's a reason why I'm number one every single fucking week. Because I know what I'm talking about. If Edge chose his opponent, don't you think that would have made the Elimination Chamber just a wee bit more important? If Edge shows Roman Reigns on the Friday following the Royal Rumble like he should have, then that opens up Drew McIntyre to defend the WWE title against Sheamus 
at the Elimination Chamber. And then WWE could put six geeks in the Elimination Chamber. And that one geek who wins the Chamber challenges Drew McIntyre for the WWE title at WrestleMania. Now, if Edge chose Drew McIntyre, just reverse the shows. Roman Reigns can defend against a Cesaro or a Nakamura or whoever else they got lined up for Roman Reigns. And then WWE could take six geeks on SmackDown, put them in the chamber, and that one geek who wins that match challenges Roman Reigns at WrestleMania. Was it that hard to figure out, folks? I mean, am I speaking a foreign language to you? Is there something that you don't understand here? If there is, may God help your soul. Nobody's going to be able to help you at that point. Now, if WWE went that route, they'd have a chamber match, which opens up WWE to be doing the same thing with the women. They want to have a chamber match for the women. However you want to weasel it or finagle it, you could do that. So you can have a men's and a women's chamber match. WWE could have a WWE title match with Drew McIntyre and Sheamus or Roman Reigns defending the universal title against the Cesaro or Shinsuke Nakamura or whoever they have built up. Another match with Kevin Owens. WWE could realistically be looking at five matches for the chamber. Instead, we're looking at two because of their lack of effort. And the way that they've decided to book the road to WrestleMania going into the Elimination Chamber. They booked it all wrong. They've booked it all wrong. Instead, we have a WWE title being defended in the Chamber. Instead, we have Roman Reigns not defending the title at the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view in the Chamber. But he's waiting for somebody to wrestle about 40 minutes inside the Chamber to beat them after the fact. Which I'm hoping is somebody okay to a point where they're built up a little bit more because Roman Reigns right now is white hot, volcanic hot, and everything that he touches turns to gold. So maybe he can help somebody in that match. We'll see what happens. But WWE is using the chamber to defend the title in the chamber with no real direct effect on what that title will be doing at WrestleMania. WWE is using the chamber to just exist. They're putting Drew McIntyre in the chamber for no reason whatsoever. An unimportant reason. It's not going to factor into WrestleMania. Everything that Drew McIntyre and Roman Reigns are going to be doing at WrestleMania has to go through Fastlane. And I want to be wrong on this, but I know I'm not. And this is what happens when the WWE product goes even more mainstream or even more Wall Street and they make more money. The more money that they make, the worse the fucking shows get. The more money that they make, the worse creative gets. WWE's putting all their eggs in this fast lane basket because fast lane is the first pay per view that's going to be debuting on Peacock. The fuck does fast lane have to do with WrestleMania? Nothing. Fast lane wasn't even on the pay per view calendar before 2021, it just came out of nowhere. And you want me to think that Fastlane is more of a vital pay-per-view to WrestleMania. It's going to flesh out WrestleMania more in two weeks. Two weeks before WrestleMania is Fastlane. More so than the Elimination Chamber. Shame on you. So not only has WWE fucked up the road to WrestleMania with their lackadaisical bankruptcy-like booking, WWE has now added the Elimination Chamber on a laundry list of gimmicks and stipulations and matches that they've killed. The Royal Rumble match is not the same. Money in the Bank killed, buried, ruined. They haven't done anything with the Money in the Bank briefcase at all in the last three years. They got the TLC pay-per-view. That means nothing. Hell in a Cell is absolutely fucking worthless. Now you can add the Elimination Chamber to the laundry list of things that WWE finds and deems unimportant. King of the Rings, another one. When was the last time we seen King of the Ring? Baron Corbin still running around with a fucking Burger King crown on. He let go of the cape, still got the scepter, but King of the Rings should be a yearly thing. All of these things help out talent get over. WWE doesn't realize that. So instead of having two matches in this Elimination Chamber nonsense, 
by what Ringside News is reporting, only two matches. WWE realistically could have had five matches. They could have had five matches. It sucks. I hate being right, man. I really hate being right all the fucking time. Can I be wrong once? I think it's humanly and statistically impossible. Now, possible reason why WWE changed original plans for the top elimination chamber match. This is according to Dave Meltzer in this week's Wrestling Observer Newsletter. WWE had plans for Roman Reigns to defend his universal title inside the Elimination Chamber at the pay-per-view on Sunday. WWE had already confirmed another Elimination Chamber match for the Raw brand featuring Drew McIntyre versus Randy Orton versus Jeff Hardy versus AJ Styles versus The Miz, who is now not in the Chamber. He gave up his spot because he is the Money in the Bank briefcase holder. He gave his, I guess, his spot away to Kofi Kingston. Or he didn't really give it away. He... Wrestled Kofi Kingston in a match on Monday Night Raw where if Miz won, Morrison would be in because they're partners. And then if Kofi won, which he did, he'd gain entry into the Elimination Chamber. Where Ali is to tell that story, WWE once again fucked up. Even that little caveat, they fucked up. Kofi Kingston and then obviously Sheamus, who won the gauntlet match and will be entering last, meaning he will lose on Sunday night. At the time of this report, the competitors in the second chamber match weren't known. So we go to Friday night. WWE altered plans to be, I guess, at the pay-per-view for it to be a second chamber match. Reigns won't be in it. Kevin Owens, Jey Uso, King Corbin, Sami Zayn, Daniel Bryan, and Cesaro will battle in the chamber match to become the number one contender for the title. Immediately after the match, the winner will challenge Reigns for the universal title. Meltzer speculated on The Observer this week that it appears WWE changed its plans so it wouldn't mirror what they were doing on Raw for the WWE title match. So let me get this straight. WWE is more concerned about SmackDown not mirroring Monday Night Raw. Bruce, you fucking apple-faced, red-colored fucking slob with glasses. I don't understand why... What I just said in the first story couldn't be the direction that WWE had went for the Elimination Chamber. You're worried about SmackDown mirroring Raw. Here's a fucking spoiler for you, Bruce, you fucking slob. If you went the way that I just described to you, you wouldn't have to worry about SmackDown mirroring Raw or Raw mirroring SmackDown. Now you're putting it out there in the universe that, oh, we changed this up. Because we didn't want the same thing to be on SmackDown that exists on Monday Night Raw. Look, Ma, we're trying. Hey, Vince, can I, ex- can I get an extra tug? I'm trying, boss, please. Can I get an extra lick? That's what you're worried about. SmackDown mirroring Raw. Meanwhile, if you did what I said, this wouldn't be an issue. Meltzer says this, and I quote, It's a way to get heat on Reigns, which I I fully understand. I'm not an idiot. It's a way to get heat on Reigns, but Reigns is at maximum level heat right now. He doesn't need this illogical booking to enhance his heat level. Reigns was going to be in the chamber match. That was the original idea. And then I guess they didn't want to do it on both shows or something, whatever. They wanted to tweak it, so they tweaked it. None of it makes sense, folks. None of it makes sense. None of it makes sense. I see, listen, I don't even see Daniel Bryan winning this thing because that's a waste. That is truly a waste. Now, Bryan, I don't want to sit here and say Bryan has no chance of winning. Bryan can win it, and then they could kind of, I guess, construct a storyline out of him winning and then losing to Reigns and then him getting a rematch at WrestleMania or Fastlane. I hope that's not the fucking case. He gets Brian at the chamber in this in this bullshit match where Brian just went 40 minutes in the chamber to get a universal title match that he's inevitably going to lose, only to get a fair one-on-one match at Fastlane, and then Reigns moves on to Edge. I hope that's not the case. I really hope that's not the case because Brian doesn't deserve a feud with Roman Reigns at Fastlane. You either do it at Mania or you don't. 
The next logical stop for Brian and Reigns, if it's not happening at Mania because you have some fucking weird fetish with Edge and Roman Reigns, the next logical destination for Brian and Reigns is at SummerSlam. Reigns is not losing that title. Nor should he at all. Get bored. It's not happening anytime soon. I don't see Brian, but Brian could win it. WWE can finagle a storyline. Cesaro's been hot. He could get a big win in the chamber and then go on to battle Reigns and then look strong in in defeat. WWE could easily do that. They could play up Kevin Owens again. There's a reason why Kevin Owens was brought back to television to continue his feud with Roman Reigns, even though he lost not one, not two, but three matches to Roman Reigns. Stunned everybody on SmackDown two weeks ago. Could be Kevin Owens getting another shot and looking even better, winning the chamber, going into Elimination Chamber after that, matches over to Battle Reigns and look good and bring Roman to defeat. Try to beat Roman Reigns, come as close as he's ever come after going through the chamber. His stock would rise, no question. But again, the question remains, what do you do with Kevin Owens after all of that and what does he do at WrestleMania? I don't know. I don't know what you're going to do with Kevin Owens at WrestleMania. I got some ideas, but I don't think WWE is going to go and do any of them. So if WWE did what I had stated in the beginning of this show, we wouldn't be in this situation where they're worried about SmackDown mirroring Raw. Just doesn't make any sense to me, man. It really doesn't make any sense at all to me why they went the way that they did. WWE producers and their workflow fell apart due to anger, not getting raises and bonuses. This is an exclusive from Ringside News. This is a follow-up to last week's story. WWE, if you guys missed out on that, informed their staff that raises and bonuses were not coming this year. They were frozen. Now, that means that they're not getting them right now, but they may get them in the distant future. This is an attempt to help stock prices, and tons of people are upset throughout the company. Now, it's been reported since then that WWE didn't give out raises, they didn't give out bonuses, and they didn't give out promotions. But it's since been reported that WWE, they didn't give this to everybody, but they gave it to a majority of the people. That WWE gave out $4,000, or not $4,000, but 4,000 individual WWE stocks to a majority of the people that were expecting raises, bonuses, and or promotions. So they got 4,000 shares in WWE stock. Now, the way you look at it, that could be positive, could be negative. You could be happy with that. You could be unhappy with that. But if the stock prices go up, then you're automatically getting even more money on top of what WWE already promised you in the raises, bonuses, and or promotions. So WWE at least is doing something to try and keep everybody grounded and everybody happy. $4,000 in individual stocks of the WWE stock is not that bad. I mean, I take that. That's not a bad deal at all, but you can't go and say someone's getting something or Promise something to somebody and then take it back. You know what? Yeah, we're going to go back on that. You're not getting your raises or your bonuses or your promotions this year. They're actually frozen and we'll give them out when we see fit. When the stock goes up. What if the stock never goes up? Vince McMahon's salary, Vince McMahon's fucking net worth is the stock. So what happens if it never goes up? Then Vince isn't, isn't likely to give out raises or, or be generous to anybody on his team. Ringside News has learned that Mark Carano's handling of giving this news to the WWE producers was quote unquote very poor, but they were actually, they actually not only criticized Carano, but they actually, I would say, respected him a little bit more than normal because he actually embraced his team and he directly gave the information to his team. It was handled poorly, but at least he had the balls to, sh to face everybody and tell them what exactly was going on. We were told that producers were at odds with each other over this news. WWE employees were expecting those raises and bonuses after their annual review. This is going to make up for a pay cut that they had to take during the pandemic. Now that cost of living increase isn't happening. Additionally, we were told that the producers had no unity 
and the workflow fell apart because of their anger since there is no one else for them to go to or take it out on. As we here at Ringside News previously reported, Mark Carano did get some credit because he did actually face everyone and deliver the bad news. Bruce Pritchard, on the other hand, ran from his team, ran from the announcement and delegated the task to WWE's new senior vice president of creative writing, Christine Lubrano, who's been there for one month. She don't know anybody and they don't know her. This is Bruce's team. This is Bruce's department. He said, fuck you. I'm not doing it. Christine Lubrano, you go and do it. I'm going to go and tickle Vince McMahon's left testicle. Apparently, he gave me a text message earlier in the day. He said, it's very itchy. I got to go take care of this for him immediately. And then I have to go and sit down and have four slices of cheesecake in catering baked by Titus because I'm a fat slob who'd rather eat than write a good show. During Wrestling Observer Radio, Dave Meltzer discussed the company's line of reasoning for nixing bonuses, raises, and promotions. He explained that despite a year of record profits, WWE didn't see the stock prices the way that they want. He says, and I quote, there was definitely a lot of unhappiness this week. A lot of the producers end. It's because the profits are not as high as Wall Street was expecting and the stock has fallen and they are trying to rebuild that stock price. The stock price is really a big deal, so that is the reason. Of course it's a big deal. It's pretty much what Vince McMahon is gauging his net worth on. So it is what it is, folks. But they did get, and it's been since reported that they are getting not everybody, but the majority. I wonder who the not everybody is. They are getting 4,000 uh, 4, individual stocks. I keep saying $4,000. It's definitely worth more than $4,000, but they are getting 4,000 individual shares of WWE stock. So I will keep you guys updated on that. And hopefully everybody does get what was promised to them because they came to work and they risked themselves in the middle of a pandemic to put on weekly television, whether it was taped or taped to be live or live, live in front of everybody at the Thunderdome on a close set. They deserve some compensation. Vince asked them to come to work bracing the conditions. So they need to be properly rewarded. They need to be compensated. That's just the name of the game. That's fair. Now, Vince can do whatever the fuck he wants. It's his company. You don't have to be there. You don't have to work there. You could quit if you want. I don't see anybody doing that. That's where the money is. But they do deserve some credit. They do deserve some compensation. So at least give them that. Hopefully, everything works out for these fine folks that are working hard and diligently on giving us the WWE product on a weekly basis. Man, let me tell you something. I love quality over quantity. And anybody that knows me personally, anybody that knows me on this show knows that I feel that same exact way. I say it all the time about the WWE product. It's always quantity over quality with a lot of these people. But it's never quality over quantity. I love quality over quantity. Take a look at this, man. This is the Ridge Wallet. This is the new Ridge Wallet. This is the Damascus Ridge Wallet. This now makes my third Ridge wallet in my collection, man. I almost have as many Ridge wallets as there are seasons. It's unreal. I love it. And this is what makes the perfect tag team of Ridge and off the script. Today's podcast is brought to you by the Ridge wallet. It's light. It's sleek. It's industrial. It doesn't awkwardly bulge in your back pocket. And it's seriously change my entire outlook on the wallet game. I don't really understand why people are still carrying around old, decrepit, ripped, worn down, beaten up wallets. Old hotel room keys, you're still carrying around those hotel room keys from your first date pictures. You probably don't even remember when the goddamn picture was taken, right? Receipts, gift cards, you don't need all that crap, man. The Ridge is here to streamline your everyday life. Why have people moved on from large flip phones to smartphones, but we can't upgrade our actual wallets to look just as good and fit with the times, man? I don't really understand. Now, the Ridge, it holds up to 12 cards plus room for cash on the Damascus. I got the cash strap. You guys can opt for the money clip as well. There's over 30 colors and styles, including the carbon fiber 
and burnt titanium. I really love it. But don't take my word for it. They got 30,000 five-star reviews, one of them being from me. 30,000 five-star reviews on the Ridge wallet alone. The durable materials means that each wallet comes with a lifetime warranty. You can buy one wallet and own it for the rest of your life. And the Ridge team is so confident that you guys are gonna love the wallet, that they'll let you test drive it for 45 days. And if you don't like it, which I don't know why you won't, you will get a full refund no matter what. On top of all that, guys, if that doesn't sell you on the Ridge wallet, it has RFID blocking qualities. Now, what this means is that when you go out, your social security number, your ID, your credit card information, it will all be protected with the RFID blocking technology so you guys will not be compromised by digital pickpockers. It's awesome. And it gives me that sense of security that I love and need when I go out and I want to have a good time. Get 10% off today, guys, using code SCRIPT10 at checkout. Ridge.com slash SCRIPT10. You guys are going to enter that little code in at checkout, SCRIPT10. Not only are you going to get 10% off, but you're going to get free worldwide shipping. Guys, go and get yourself a Ridge wallet today, and I want to thank them for supporting Off The Script. Fuck Bruce Pritchard. That's how I'm going to transition into the next story. Fuck Bruce Pritchard. Now, I told you about the story about Bruce and how he delegated the unfortunate circumstance to Christine Lubrano about telling the writing team that she doesn't know it all in a position that she's held in just one month, for one month, to tell them that they weren't getting raises, like they know her and respect her and appreciate her and have welcomed her as a part of the team, right? Bruce didn't do that because he doesn't give a shit whether anybody gets a raise or a bonus or not. As long as he is getting paid by Vince McMahon, he don't give a fuck about anything. As long as he holds ultimate power. In WWE, that's all he wants. He's not there to befriend. He's not there to give advice. He's not there to lend a shoulder on to anybody if they need to vent or complain or cry. That was Bruce last week. Bruce this week has a new practice backstage, folks. This is a new thing for WWE and Bruce Pritchard now. He's got a new practice that is now keeping even more writers in the dark Backstage. Now, what does that mean exactly? Ringside News has learned that WWE writers on the Raw brand no longer get notes from the meetings with Vince McMahon. Therefore, if a writer is on the team, on Bruce's team, and not in the meeting with Vince, then they are left in the dark. Or They are left to guess about direction, creative direction, left to guess about creative direction because they were cut out of the loop. Now, I have a lot of questions here, man. I don't really understand this first line or this first statement in this story. I really don't get it. What would cause somebody to not be in that meeting with Vince McMahon? Why would there be a writer or writers that are unable to make this meeting with Vince McMahon? Isn't everybody there? Aren't you supposed to show up to work on a weekly basis? I mean, you work two days a week. The other five, you should be writing this show or these shows. But you got to show up to work for two days. So why wouldn't you be at the tapings on Monday? Why wouldn't you be at the tapings on Friday? They're both the same teams, by the way, folks. They are both the same writing teams. What would cause somebody to miss a meeting with Vince McMahon early in the day before they start getting things ready for Monday Night Raw? An illness? A family emergency? Maybe he ate something bad in Titus Catering that gave him or her the shits? I don't know. Maybe they just don't want to stare across the table at Bruce Pritchard as all of their creative ideas are fucking ignored. And he gets to suck the corporate cock and all his ideas are used. Meanwhile, you're one of these creative geeks that sits there and you contemplate life. Why am I working here? Why am I lending my 
so-called talents to these fucking people and none of my ideas make it to the fucking cutting room floor. I don't know. I don't know. I would love to know what would cause somebody to not make a meeting with Vince McMahon as far as creative direction for a Raw or a SmackDown. And even if they are, why would you not tell anybody else on the writing team what was discussed in that meeting? You want to know why, folks? Because it doesn't matter who knows and who doesn't know. Your ideas are not going to be used anyway. You could take fucking Bill in creative, and if Steve missed the meeting, Bill is not going to go out of his way and explain what happened because Bill sat there and none of his ideas were being used, so Steve's ideas wouldn't have been used. All of Bruce's ideas were being thrown back and forth with Vince McMahon, and the only ones that are getting ideas out there and are going to be used are Vince and Bruce. Bill and Steve, their ideas don't fucking matter. Bruce knows that. Bill knows that. Steve knows that. So Bill's not going to tell Steve. And Bruce is not going to tell Bill. So what's the point? What is the point? Everybody's cut out of the loop. You don't get to know what we're doing as far as creative. And and folks, by the way, even if they do set aside something creatively, why do you give a shit? Why do you give a shit? None of it's going to make sense anyway. So the best thing for you, Bill and Steve and whoever else is on the writing team is to stay away because you should not want to be a part of their vision because whatever the fuck they've been producing is complete and utter trash. So why would you even bother? But it goes to show you this is a power hungry play. This is a power stance by Bruce Pritchard. He's in the meeting. He needs to have all his team members at the meeting. If there's one or three or five team members that are not at the meeting for whatever fucking reason, I still don't know why they wouldn't be there. Bruce is not going to tell those fucking people because Bruce wants all of the power for himself. Bruce doesn't want anybody else to get a say or Bruce doesn't want anybody else to have an idea because what if those ideas are better than whatever Bruce comes up with and presents to Vince McMahon? Don't you think that's going to make Bruce look like a bad boss? Why is this fucking Joe Schmo fucking geek with the pocket protector and creative coming up with better ideas than the executive director of Monday and Friday Night Smackdown and Monday Night Raw? Now we can't have that. Are you fucking kidding me? One tenured member of the creative team with direct knowledge of the situation said, And I quote, I don't know why Bruce would have most of the staff operate in the dark, but it seems to me like it's just another Bruce power grab. There you go, folks. A tenured member of the writing team expressed this to Ringside News. Ringside News also heard a remark hoping that Vince McMahon will come to his senses or he will realize what has happened with this situation and how they have created this environment backstage. We are on the road to WrestleMania and many people who should know what's going on do not know what is going on and are still left guessing. Why is there no plans for WrestleMania, folks? Because Bruce has left everybody in the fucking dark. And for Bruce to come up with anything that makes sense... He's going to wait and wait and wait and wait and wait until Vince McMahon comes up with something and then he's going to say, yeah, 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 that's that's what we should do, Vince. That's what we should do, boss. If he lets Bill and Steve on the creative team come up with ideas, then that's going to make him look bad. And the WWE creative circle goes round and round. Is WWE planning Shane McMahon Versus Braun Strowman at WrestleMania 37. I hope to God not, but I will take this over Braun Strowman being in the WWE title situation. Shane McMahon returned to WWE Raw a couple weeks ago to make an announcement about the Elimination Chamber. Then he wasn't back at this previous week's show. Braun Strowman did in fact return and he was looking for Shane McMahon. 
Now, during Wrestling Observer Radio, Dave Meltzer addressed Braun Strowman's WWE return. It seemed that the... Uh, woo! Woo! The Strowman Express... The Strowman Express had eyes on Shane McMahon. Now, this could result in... So I know you guys were waiting for me to fall out of the chair. It's not happening, geeks. It's not happening. Braun Strowman did return. And he was looking for Shane McMahon. Meltzer addressed that Shane McMahon now is a target of Braun Strowman. This could result in something very quote-unquote interesting. I use that word interesting very loosely with Braun Strowman because nothing he does is interesting at all. As we head down the road to WrestleMania, Meltzer says this and I quote, So WWE, what are they going to do at WrestleMania? Does this mean that Braun and Shane are set to wrestle at WrestleMania? Hey, it could happen. That's all Meltzer said. WWE will often drop hints just to see how they fly upon getting out there. It seems that the idea might be floating around for Shane McMahon to have a match on one of the two nights at WrestleMania 37. Braun Strowman could very well be a big man for Mr. Shadow Punch to jump into the ring with since Kevin Owens has seemingly called dibs on jumping off the pirate ship already. Again, at WrestleMania, McMahon might need to find somewhere else to take his big leap at WrestleMania this year if the match goes down. Folks, I I mean, listen, I I don't even know what to say as far as this goes. Like, Like, what am I supposed to say? Am I supposed to be jumping for joy about Shane McMahon being on the WrestleMania card, taking a spot away from a bright up and comer who's been there all year? Yes, let's give Shane McMahon a match. The guy who created the failure known as Raw Underground. Yeah, let's give another WrestleMania spot to a McMahon. Let's throw the McMahon bat signal up there. When things are bleeding and things are dismal and the ratings are down, let's call a McMahon to be back on television. As long as it's not Stephanie McMahon. Which makes me question, if we get Shane... How likely do we get Triple H at WrestleMania? Because you know AJ Styles has been lobbying for a match against Triple H at WrestleMania. What if we get Shane McMahon and Triple H on WrestleMania's card this year? That is two matches taken up by McMahons. And the rest taken up by part-timers. It's unbelievable. What, What would you guys like me to say about this? I mean, I guess I don't mind. I guess the story is there. Braun Strowman put his hands on Adam Pearce right before the TLC pay-per-view, if you guys remember that. He went out with injury, did Braun Strowman. He had a legitimate injury, whether it was his knees and then he got a blood infection that I'm glad he's back and healthy. But he was suspended, quote-unquote, from television. They wrote him off television. Now he's back. He was in the middle of that WWE title hunt. Instead of doing AJ, it would have been Braun. So he's looking for his shot. He's looking for his shot at the WWE title. So he's back on television. Shane McMahon makes this match. He chooses all the guys in the Elimination Chamber. He leaves out Braun Strowman, coincidentally, because nobody knew Braun was back. He showed up a week late. Whose fucking fault is that? Shane didn't know you were fucking back. There's a logic gap right there. You want to show up a week after the fucking match was made. Where the fuck were you on the show when Shane McMahon made the goddamn match? So Braun, a dummy, like always. But I I guess it makes sense. He still owed something that he should have been a part of. But even then, he put his hands on Adam Pearce. What the fuck did he expect to happen? Adam Pearce was going to present him a box of fucking Entenmann's cookies as a thank you? And a nice heartwarming gesture? Like, what what the fuck did he expect was going to happen? So he's back. I guess it makes sense. Just gave you two logic gaps. He's back. He wants his WWE title shot. He's not in the chamber. Who made the match? Shane McMahon made the match. Well, if Shane McMahon doesn't make it right, then heads are going to roll. Sounds like a fucking match to me. But hey, it might not make sense. It might make sense to the fucking geek out there that doesn't give a shit about logic and common sense. But as long as it keeps Braun Strowman 
away from Drew McIntyre. That's all I care about. So I guess this is a win-win situation. It gets Strowman on the card. A McMahon has to be on the card in this case, if this is the direction. Gets Braun Strowman on the card. There's absolutely nobody on Monday Night Raw I want to see him in the ring against. The guy is fucking terrible. Everything he does is utter boring. It's utter trash. So if Braun Strowman is on WrestleMania, I would rather be in a situation where he's in the ring with Shane McMahon and not Drew McIntyre. Or AJ Styles or Keith Lee or Matt Riddle or Bobby Lashley because it's not going to result in a WrestleMania-esque match. Shane McMahon is more WrestleMania-esque than Braun Strowman is, so I guess it works out for him. The only way Braun Strowman gets a WrestleMania moment this year is being in the ring with Shane McMahon because it's not happening against anybody else because it doesn't speak to me as being WrestleMania. The sad thing is, this somehow does in all its illogical glory. WWE, WWE has yet to decide on plans for Drew McIntyre at WrestleMania. Folks, I, I, I don't like, I, I listen, I don't like sitting here. You know, fuck it. I, I, I love it. I love sitting here expressing to everybody how I'm right. And most of everybody that hates my fucking guts and wished I got run over by a speeding vehicle while I left my house. It, hey, it, 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 I just fucking love it. it. It burns on the inside of these people that they know I'm right. Even those people that hate my guts, they know that I'm right, but they will never admit it. It's got to be an awful feeling, man. It's got to be an awful feeling for these geeks out there. There's no plan for Drew McIntyre. There would be a plan for Drew McIntyre if you followed what I said in the beginning of this show, talking about the Elimination Chamber card and how WWE should have handled it, right? Now we're in a situation exactly how I described it to you. Well, if you do this, then Drew McIntyre's not going to have a set opponent for WrestleMania. Thus, this is the factual reality. I know it stings a little bit. I, I'm sorry. I got, I got some fucking ointment for you. Take care of that. The card for WrestleMania 37 is still coming along. Month and a half away. What, what is it? February 20th. It's still coming along. Dude, we are a month and a half away from WrestleMania, and the WrestleMania card is still coming along. This card should be fucking completed in goddamn crayon at this point. Then to pencil, then to pen, and then in marker. I'm not saying that it has to be the exact car that you come up with today or before today. Obviously, you could scribble something out or erase something, but I don't know how you don't have a, a set plan for WrestleMania. Now, WrestleVotes posted a tweet on Friday morning noting some of the planned matches for the show, but the matches are not set in stone. Currently, Edge... Versus Roman Reigns for the Universal Championship. Bianca Belair versus Sasha Banks for the SmackDown Women's title. Randy Orton versus Bray Wyatt. And a tag team match featuring Bugs Bunny and Damian Priest versus John Morrison and The Miz. Are the matches being discussed so far? So let me get this straight, folks. I didn't read Drew McIntyre's name out there. I didn't see Drew McIntyre's name anywhere in this, in this report here. You got Roman Reigns. You got Edge. You got Bianca. You got Sasha. You got Orton. You got The Fiend. You got Damian Priest. You got John Morrison and The Miz. Where's your WWE champion? So the one thing that jumps off the fucking page to me, folks, and I know you're probably thinking it before I even say it, why does Bad Bunny have a fucking match over the WWE champion planned ahead of the WWE champion Drew McIntyre at WrestleMania? Does that not bother you? I mean, I, I mean, I mean if I'm Drew McIntyre, I know that bothers me. Why the fuck you got Bugs Bunny over here with a planned match for WrestleMania, 
but I'm the WWE champion, the face of this fucking company, the face of this brand, and you got plans for him over me. You got an idea what you want to do with him and not me at WrestleMania. One name that is missing, says Russell Votes, is Drew McIntyre. And this indicates that the company has yet to decide what he will be doing and who he will be defending the title against at WrestleMania. McIntyre will obviously be at WrestleMania, and he's defending his WWE title on Sunday at the Elimination Chamber against Sheamus, Randy Orton, AJ Styles, Kofi Kingston, and Jeff Hardy. Now, they said on Twitter, and I quote Russell Votes, Conversation with a source recently stated that the latest WrestleMania creative meeting had Edge vs. Reigns, Bel Air vs. Banks, Orton vs. Wyatt, and Bad Bunny tagging with Damian Priest against Miz and Morrison with nearly everything else open, including the WWE title matchup. Same source stressed nothing is set in stone, however. Oh, thank you. Thank you, WrestleVotes. Thank you, anonymous source. Maybe nothing is set in stone. Maybe we don't get Reigns and Edge at WrestleMania. This is what bothers the living shit out of me, folks. The WWE Championship, along with every other title, is worthless. Roman Reigns, in all of the years that the Universal title has existed, even when Lesnar had it. I guess Lesnar is somebody that has this star power. He possesses this star power. So, you know, I'm going to exclude him because he's not a full-timer. Roman Reigns is the only full-time guy that has ever held the Universal Championship and made it mean something. And that is factual information. Nobody has done a better job full-time with the Universal title than Roman Reigns. I don't get how Drew McIntyre is being disrespected here. Why the WWE title is being disrespected here. Would you book Roman Reigns at WrestleMania the way that you booked Drew McIntyre? I don't think that they would. Would you give Bad Bunny a match? Would you include Bad Bunny plans for WrestleMania over coming up with plans for Roman Reigns at WrestleMania? Would you make him a priority over Roman Reigns as the Universal Champion? So why are you doing it with Drew McIntyre? I I don't really understand. This this is very bizarre to me. And how people just sit there and say, hey man, it is what it is. This is the right match. Edge and Reigns needs to happen. The fuck are you talking about? Edge and Reigns needs to happen. Don't you understand that the fucking situation that I just literally read to you is the same fucking problem I told you was going to exist four weeks ago? I don't hear you now. Why are we doing this and not what I had laid forth? Bad Bunny has plans over Drew McIntyre. Bad Bunny has plans over the WWE title. Fine. Fine. What I don't get is how WWE and fans thinks that reports like this make WWE look good, make WrestleMania look good in in, in this light. You got four matches. You got the Universal title, the SmackDown Women's title, Orton Wyatt, and a fucking tag team match with a singer that nobody gives a fuck about. Four matches. On a two-night show. What exactly are you doing with Drew McIntyre? Is there anybody on Monday Night Raw even worth challenging Drew McIntyre for the WWE title? I ran through a list of people. It's not going to be Jeff Hardy. It's not going to be Elias. It's not going to be Keith Lee. It's not going to be Matt Riddle. It's not going to be AJ Styles. Who else is on Monday Night Raw? That you could possibly think of that is worth a WWE title match at WrestleMania. There's nobody that jumps off the page, folks. Nobody. Michael Cole is more of a fucking challenger for Drew McIntyre at this point than anybody on the active fucking roster. 
So it means one of two things. A, what they're doing with Bobby Lashley could mean Bobby Lashley versus Drew McIntyre at WrestleMania. I'm not, I'm not excited about that at all, being that they wrestled last year. There's been a little bit of time in between that if they wanted to do it again, it would be all right. But Bobby Lashley in no way, shape, or form should be beating Drew McIntyre to become the WWE champion. If Bobby Lashley and Drew McIntyre is your match, fine. Then take the title, the U.S. title off of Bobby Lashley, put it on Matt Riddle, and there you got Matt Riddle versus Keith Lee for the United States Championship at WrestleMania. You want to include AJ Styles? Put AJ Styles in that, make it a triple threat match. That's what I would do. If that's what you are going to do, there's only one of two guys on Monday Night Raw that are doing anything against Drew McIntyre. Bobby Lashley is one of them. The other one is not even on the fucking show right now. John Cena? I said it last week. I'm going to operate under the fact that John Cena is not going to be at WrestleMania. He makes the most sense out of everybody because of number 17 and the chase for number 17. But what I'm thinking of is either Bobby Lashley or WWE brings back, or maybe they're waiting for Brock Lesnar to give them word. Brock Lesnar comes back. And we get Lesnar versus McIntyre again. What this means for the WWE title, I don't know. Would WWE even contemplate giving Lesnar the title back, undoing everything you did with McIntyre just one year prior? Maybe we get Lesnar versus McIntyre rematch. Maybe we get Lesnar versus McIntyre versus Keith Lee for the WWE title. That's been rumored. That was rumored weeks ago. I don't know. If that's the case, Keith Lee wouldn't be challenging for the United States title. It would be Matt Riddle versus Bobby Lashley again for the United States title. Maybe Lashley holds on to it a little bit longer, and they give Riddle the big win in front of fans at WrestleMania and crown him the new United States champion. Maybe they're waiting for Lesnar. I don't know. That's not something I want to see. I'm sure that's not something you guys want to see either. But why are we in this situation to begin with? Why are we here? Why is this so difficult? All you had to do was have Edge challenge McIntyre. All you had to do was make that match. You have an opponent for WrestleMania for Roman Reigns. His name is Daniel Bryan. And every time I mention Brian and Reigns, you get some fucking geek. You get some fucking idiot. Oh, well, Brian, he doesn't have any momentum. They haven't built him up as a champion. He's Daniel fucking Brian. He doesn't need a fucking reason. And I don't know if you've just joined the fucking show in progress. But Brian has a built-in story that they've been teasing for months. Whether it's on SmackDown or whether it's on Talking Smack with Paul Heyman and Daniel Bryan. I mean, as of last week, Daniel Bryan just made fun of Roman Reigns for him working on a Brock Lesnar part-time contract. They're certainly building and teasing towards an inevitable match. Why aren't we getting that for WrestleMania? Why are we leaving Drew McIntyre in the fucking dark? It's what I don't understand. These people think that whatever WWE is doing now is the right way, is the right creative way. It's not. What happened to rounding out WrestleMania as a whole and making it the best card it could possibly be? If you're one of these fucking people arguing arguing with me that Roman Reigns and Daniel Bryan doesn't make the WrestleMania card look better or feel better or operate better, better in any way, shape, or form, you need to have your social media fucking access revoked, never to be had again! How on any planet does that match not make a fucking card or a show better? You're looking at WrestleMania now. You happy with what you're getting now? Drew McIntyre not on a fucking show yet? With an opponent in mind yet a month and a half from WrestleMania? It's what the Elimination Chamber is for. But WWE fucked that up like I expressed already and have been doing for the last five weeks now. Roman Reigns versus Daniel Bryan. Drew McIntyre versus Edge. 
What's so hard? What is so difficult? Then you got the women's title. You want Bianca and Sasha? Go at it. God bless you. The Raw Women's title, Lacey's pregnant. Goodbye. Can't wait to not see you in fucking nine months. Asuka, Charlotte, Rhea, triple threat match. I don't advocate for triple threat matches, but that one makes sense. Rhea and Asuka, fresh. Rhea getting a win over Charlotte. Needs to happen. Four matches right there, folks. Four matches right there. Randy Orton and Bray Wyatt, who gives a fuck about Randy Orton and Bray Wyatt? I know I don't. I'm over it. And whatever else you want to add to the show, but as long as the top matches are set out for you. Why are we in a discussion right now where Bad Bunny has plans over the WWE title? That is a fucking crime amongst humanity in pro wrestling. Why has WWE gone lackadaisical with the most important WrestleMania of our lifetime? Coming out of a pandemic. This show is going to be used as the beacon for coming out of the pandemic and hopefully getting back to normal. It's the light at the end of the tunnel. And you're going into this, eh, whatever will be, will be. Whatever happens, happens. We'll, uh, we'll get to it when we get to it. The most important WrestleMania of our lifetime. That's the way you're going to operate. You don't want this show to be the best it could possibly be? There's a built-in fucking story with Brian and Reigns. Why not do it? Edge has nothing to do with Roman Reigns. He has nothing to do with Drew McIntyre either. But I'm talking about making the WrestleMania card complete. Whole. Better. This is a weak WrestleMania card. Bray Wyatt and Randy Orton, did you guys remember what they did last time? They were in the ring at WrestleMania? And don't give me the fact, oh, it's going to be a funhouse match. Give me a fucking break, funhouse match. The John Cena match was not good. It wasn't even a fucking match. That's what you want at WrestleMania? We're over that, man. Move on. Move on. It needs to be a topic of discussion. Why aren't we making the best WrestleMania card possible? And why is WWE not doing what they should be doing? Brian should already be in a position where he's built up. Yet you've started it, stopped it, started it, stopped it. And now you just dropped it to a point where he's doing the fucking Macarena with Otis and Chad Gable on SmackDown. He even has a situation in what he's doing now, losing... That could be built into the overall story that already exists between them. Can he do it anymore? He's on the last road of his career. Can he do it anymore? He's losing. Can he beat Roman Reigns? On top of everything that already came out of the Yes movement that harmed Roman for the last six years. Don't ever discuss creative with me. My vision is exactly what the vision should be of this show. If I was in control of this show, there would be not one person right now, if I was in control of this WrestleMania season, there'd be not one fucking person. You might not like it, but there would be not one person that would say to me, man, that doesn't make sense. Everything that I've discussed, man, has been picture perfect on point. There's no way you can refute anything I've said about Coming out of the Royal Rumble, going into the Chamber, going into Fastlane, going into the WrestleMania show on April 10, April 11. You might not like it, but at the end of the day, as always, I'm right. And everything that I've stated here makes the most sense. And WWE has chosen the road that doesn't make sense at all. You need to stop being complacent. This is the most important WrestleMania of our generation in the middle of a pandemic with live fans there for the first time since March. And this is what you're presenting me? If that show is in grade A, 100% from top to bottom, the rest, rest, the best WrestleMania show you could possibly put on, why are you even here? Get with the program and make WrestleMania the best it could be, and it does not include Edge and Reigns. I've been saying it for weeks. 
And I'll be saying it for the next six weeks as we get into WrestleMania. All right, man, let's get on with the rest of the show. We still have a lot to uncover, so don't go anywhere. We got Friday night, Monday night, Wednesday night to talk about. I got news on Kyle O'Reilly. I got major news on Kyle O'Reilly. And how everybody was, quote unquote, worked. <laughs> I got news on Natalia, believe it or not. Why Natalia is in the news is ridiculous. I got news on Andrade. I got news on Alistair Black. I got news on Keith Lee. Don't go nowhere, man. There's a lot of good stuff coming up. Let's talk about Friday Night SmackDown. Their ratings dipped below 2 million, and rightfully so. The show was not good at all. Episode drew an ad. At least it's better than Raw. That much I can say. At least it's better than Raw. Last week's show drew an average of 1.883 million. That was down from the previous week of 2.126 on Fox. The first hour did a 1.905. Hour two did a 1.862. Pulled in an average of 0.50 in the 18 to 49 demographic, which was good for number two on the evening. That was down from the previous week of 0.60. Rollins made his return. Don't know if it's babyface Rollins or... Heel Rollins, but he came back with this cult leadership mentality. With me as your leader, we will see the promised sun, the promised land. I will take SmackDown to the heights that it should always be. Whatever the case may be with Seth Rollins, bullshit. Had all the talent circle the ring. They brought them out like they were in a classroom assembly. Cesaro was the only one remaining. Everybody left. It's exactly what I would have done. Rollins speaking, goodbye. You're a fucking geek. Nobody gives a shit. Cesaro was the only one that remained out there to listen. Then he walked away. And Seth Rollins went from babyface to heel. He attacks Cesaro in the aisleway. Out comes Daniel Bryan. They tease the potential WrestleMania match between Bryan and Rollins. But it came out to his babyface theme. It's like somebody forgot that Rollins was a heel. For most of 2020. Then he goes on the bump and he says, yeah, it really doesn't fit my character with the babyface theme music that I got. Maybe we'll go back and get me some heel theme music. But you had heel theme music all last year. What happened to it? It was one of the better new theme musics. It fit him quite well. That's just me. So he made his return. Big E versus Shinsuke Nakamura went to a no contest for the Intercontinental title. Baron Corbin and Sami Zayn advanced to the Elimination Chamber by defeating the Mysterios, Ray and Dominic. Bobby Roode and Dolph Ziggler, the tag team champions, fuck them. They were on the show Friday. They were also in an Elimination Chamber qualifier against Daniel Bryan and Cesaro. I'll leave it up to you as to who won that one. Tag team champions lost on television. There was nobody else to put in that situation to advance Bryan and Cesaro in the chamber. I don't get why champions have to lose on television. Whether the championships are worth anything or not, champions shouldn't lose. That's just my honest opinion. The Street Profits defeated Otis and Chad Gable. And that was your SmackDown. Edge is going to show up on SmackDown. According to reports, I just got a notification. Edge is going to start SmackDown off tonight. Which is yesterday for you guys because you're watching this tomorrow. Who cares? Is what I say. That was SmackDown. Natalia, she's on SmackDown, if I am not mistaken. Natalia tears into the WWE on Fox Twitter account, tears them a new asshole, tears them a Nia Jax hole. Apparently, WWE on Fox, I don't know who runs it. They upset Natalia because Natalia tweeted out a response to a meme. Yes, folks, Natalia got triggered. The entire women's locker room got triggered by a meme that WWE on Fox's Twitter account put up. The meme asked fans to build their own and best women's roster with a $15 budget. Now, you've seen these floating around on social media. You know, it gets people invested and talking and it develops conversation on social media. All the wrestling accounts do it, right? I get it all the time. Who's the worst 
podcaster in the IWC? Who's the biggest cancer in the IWC? And then you see these irrelevant accounts that they tweet with like a poll. It's me or it's the Sulla Monster or it's fucking DJ Storms or whoever the fuck they're naming in this goddamn thing. Whatever. Whatever. You're lucky I'm even in your fucking community. It'd be a lot dumber without me. So, you've seen this shit. The men got one as well. The men had a very similar one with a $15 budget. It's all in good fun, folks. So, Natty saw this meme and her ranking on it. Natty was in the $1 line in the tiered meme. If you guys are wondering, she was worth a dollar. Natalia Nightheart was worth a dollar in this meme. Now you had your Bianca's like $3 and Sasha and the Android $5. Becky was $5. Bailey was $5, right? Natalia was $1. Liv Morgan was $1. Ruby Riot was $1. Billy Kay was like $2. Peyton Royce was a dollar. Whatever. You guys get the point. Build your own women's roster with $15. Natty saw the meme and her ranking on it. She says this, and I quote, I have struggled for years to figure out exactly what my worth is, but I won't allow anyone to pick that number for me. As hurtful as seeing this is, I want it to be known that if I ever find myself under all of these wonderful women, it's because I'm a pillar and a foundation of what we're doing. So please... Keep your one dollar because anyone knows who knows me knows how priceless I am. And she signs it NKN. And some fans pointed out that WWE on Fox was only trying to develop conversation. But Natalia apparently was. I don't know what the fuck she was doing on this very day. Maybe she rolled out of the wrong side of the bed. I have no idea. I have no idea. Folks, I don't want to spend too much time on this irrelevant topic, but it is news, and it's funny at the same time. I just want to throw it out there, folks. It's a fucking meme. Why are you getting triggered about it? The meme is coming from WWE on Fox. Whoever's running that fucking account is a complete blithering idiot. I would not be surprised if it's fucking emo fuckface with the bad haircut who listens to shitty punk rock fuckface that works for that website that nobody gives a fuck about. That website that, again, pales in comparison to what I do. You know, the fuckface who was found at Whole Foods, who was stalking a Bella Danger with his wife. You know, who who wishes he could do what I do at the level that I do it, at the consistency that I do it, right? He knows that I'm better than him in every single way. And that pains his fucking insides. He looks like a fucking geek. You know who I'm talking about, right? You know who I'm talking about. I'm sure Bella Danger knows who, who, who I'm talking about as well. Maybe I should call her up. Grim. Grim Stoysha, my buddy Grim. Last year, he was doing some skit with Kimmy Granger. Maybe I should call him up. I'd be like, yo, Grim, you got a Bella's number. I got a, I got a couple of questions to ask her. Whoever's running that fucking account, I would not be surprised if it's emo fuckface with the bad haircut running that social media account, okay? This sounds like something he would do. Natalia, honey, it's a fucking meme. The men had the same one. Do you see any of the men locker room, any 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 f- male superstars in the, in the men's locker room crying rivers of tears because they're worth one dollar? You know, for all the times that we get called smart marks and our opinion is irrelevant, Natalia seems to be hurt. Her feelings seem to be hurt over somebody's wrestling opinion. I just wanted to be known that Natalia drew number 30 in the Royal Rumble and was eliminated. First of all, let me rephrase that. Natalia was given the number 30 position. The number 30 position was given away before the Royal Rumble show in a match with Tamina. She comes out at number 30. And how long did she last, folks? What was it, about 90 seconds? Then you wonder why you're worth a dollar. Just throwing that out there. 
The men didn't cry. It's a fucking meme. Not everything needs to be a fucking world crisis issue, okay? WWE, Bo Dallas. Where is he? I have no idea. This guy may be locked in a fucking storage freezer somewhere in catering. I don't know. Maybe they iced his body, cryogenically froze this guy for some fucking weird science experiment in 2080. I have no idea. But Bo Dallas is still employed by WWE. They're still cutting this guy checks. I don't know why. But Bo Dallas, he's still on the roster. In fact, he announced on December, I don't know what date it was, December 2019. In December 2019, that he was leaving on a life-changing expedition and he hasn't been seen since. Dallas hasn't been back on WWE television for any reason since then, but he's still with the company collecting paychecks from WWE. Now, Ringside News has exclusively reported that Bo Dallas has been backstage at SmackDown, but he's not being used. Creative has nothing for him, and his name does not come up. Wrestling Observer Newsletter and Wrestling Observer Radio, Dave Melcher discussed this situation. He explained that Bo Dallas is around, but he's simply not being used, confirming Ringside News' report. Meltzer says this, and I quote, he's there. You know, when they say that creative is nothing for him, in this, in this case, in his case, it's true. I don't know why he's been cut, but they never use him. I don't know why they didn't cut him, but they cut all those other guys that they cut in April, but he's still there. They cut Curtis Axel, the B team. Now we're uh, half a B team. They let one half of the B team go, but they left the other half still there. I guess Titus really needed him, but they didn't need Curtis Axel. I don't know. So they made all those cuts in April, but he's still there. He's still got a job. No idea what or why or anything. It's just a big mystery. Now, it was soon after this report from Meltzer that more Bo Dallas news popped up. According to The Observer and Meltzer, there was a follow-up. And Bo Dallas with Liv Morgan, who was also worth a dollar, by the way. Also worth a dollar which prompted everybody to come out of the WWE woodwork in the locker room to back up Natalia because of a fucking meme. Liv Morgan and Bo Dallas have a farm together that they run. Now, Liv Morgan is not dating Bo Dallas. They're not a couple. Dallas is engaged or married. Very religious family is Bo Dallas' family. I believe Liv Morgan is also from a very church-heavy background. They, too, have started a real estate business on the side. Now, WWE is still cutting Bo Dallas paychecks. There's no indication if he will be used ever again. He's still getting paid and has a farm living with Morgan. And they started a real estate family business and studying that to prepare for life after wrestling. So, Liv Morgan and Bo Dallas, they both realize that there is nothing in WWE for them, and they're setting themselves up at a very young age to get ahead of this life after wrestling phase. And I commend them for that. It's a very difficult thing to probably do if you're Bo Dallas, who wanted to be nothing more but a pro wrestler. And then he realized that, hey, these people don't believe in me. In turn, they probably gave this guy very low self-esteem, very low confidence. He had to go out there and make waves for himself and come up with a plan B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, Humberto. Had to throw that in there. I wonder what Humberto's doing as far as a side business goes. Seriously. But Bo Dallas and Liv Morgan are setting themselves up for success. Life after wrestling. Good for them. Good for them. Everybody should be on that same wavelength. You should always be thinking two or three steps ahead because... Whatever is happening now is not permanent. It will never be permanent. There will be an expiration date. They know that at a very early age, young age, and they're going to be better off for it. They're going to be better off for it. They may actually find more success in whatever they do outside of WWE with their own family, their own businesses than they do inside the WWE. Good on them, man. Proud of both of them for thinking ahead and getting ahead while WWE just wastes their fucking time. Speaking of wasting time, oh my goodness, man. Alistair Black and Andrade Cien Omos. 
Now, Almas, Andrade, I always call him Almas. Andrade tweeted out a picture of him standing on the announce desk at one of the takeovers holding up the NXT heavyweight title. Very subjective when I say heavyweight, but it is the major title in NXT. The NXT world title. He tweeted out a picture of him holding that up. A lot of people are jumping on this as an indication that he may be headed back down there. I don't know why he's not there already. If he's healthy, willing, and able, I don't know why he's not down there. But people are taking this and running with it as if it's some indication that he's going back down there. He's got a better chance of going back down there because why would they say no to Mr. Flair? Mr. Charlotte Flair. Now, of course, they said no to Mr. Uh, Zelina Vega. I I don't know why they would appease Mr. Zelina Vega here in this case because his wife blatantly disobeyed orders, opened up an OnlyFans, did what she had to do against WWE's rhetoric, disobeyed third-party content laws via the company. She got fired. She was a black sheep. Aleister Black was punished because of association. And now, apparently, Aleister Black has no creativity, no creative at all for Aleister Black. He is gone. They... I guess, pushed him into a black hole somewhere. Finished. He disappeared off the face of the earth. So things are not looking good for Aleister Black. It's been months since both guys have been on WWE television. Rumors are suggesting that there are plans for them to come back. Aleister Black, apparently there was rumors about Bruce and Vince getting him ready for a big re-debut. Haven't seen it yet. I wonder where this is. Same thing with Andrade. I read reports early, early in the year, probably dating back to late 2020, that Andrade was going to take himself off television for some minor elective surgery, and that WWE was going to bring him back and pair him with Charlotte to use Charlotte's star power to get him over. And I guess in the meantime, he was bettering his English. That was the rumor back just a couple of months ago. And now here we are, and Meltzer on Wrestling Observer Radio was asked, If there was a chance to revitalize Aleister Black since Paul Heyman seems to have more power on SmackDown. Meltzer says he doesn't have that kind of power right now. If he had power, yeah, I could see it. But he does not have that power and Vince does not see anything in Aleister Black or Andrade. Remember the guys. When Heyman lost his position, and I said the guys that are fucked, the only one who ended up not being completely fucked was Shayna. Because I guess they like the idea of Shayna and Nia Jax, so they pair them together. Pretty much everybody else, they are with Bo Dallas in catering, says Meltzer. Have you been listening to this particular podcast, Mr. Meltzer? How do you know that they are in catering? I thought I was the only one with that information. But joking aside, folks, I I don't know... What it is with Andrade, I don't. I always said his association with Charlotte Flair and the Flair family, he's probably in better standing than most. If a lot of people think he's buried or he's not going to go where, anywhere or up like he should because he's a fantastic pro wrestler. He always thought that association with Charlotte Flair was going to be the one thing that was going to save him and keep him on television. Aleister Black, I don't get. Because WWE, they had everything right with this guy and they broke this guy down into nothing and we are where we are with this in this current stage of the game. Aleister Black had everything that a top star needs. He had the look, the in-ring ability, he had the theme music, he had the presence, he had the entrance, he had the mic skill, he had everything you could possibly desire in a top guy. He was legit, he was a badass He made things just feel rough and intense and tough, and he was fucking great. I miss Aleister Black. I actually went back and watched Aleister Black and Adam Cole from TakeOver Philadelphia in their Extreme Rules match, man. An underrated classic. Where's that at? Where where is that, Aleister Black? I hope that's the Adam Cole and the Adam Cole that we see on current TV. I hope that is the Adam Cole that we can continue to get. I'm worried. I'm worried about Bay Bay. But there's no reason why Aleister Black should not be on television. None. Do you want to know why they're not on television, folks? This is very simple. And it doesn't really require a lot of brain work. Aleister Black 
and Andrade are not on television because Bruce Pritchard saw, upon coming into executive director, saw upon taking over Monday Night Raw, that Aleister Black and Andrade were Paul Heyman guys. And the fact that they were Paul Heyman guys, Bruce Pritchard took offense to this. Everybody was labeling these guys, Humberto and Buddy Murphy and, and all these guys, Apollo, that Paul Heyman wanted to push as the new SmackDown or Monday Night Raw 6, right? They labeled them as catering VIPs. Oh, look, Paul Heyman's bringing over the SmackDown catering crew and thinking that he's going to get them over on Monday Night Raw. Ha, ha, ha. So then Bruce takes over for Paul Heyman on Monday night. He undoes literally everything that Paul Heyman wanted to do on Monday night. And this is the product of that. Whatever Paul Heyman wanted to do, Bruce Pritchard took and eradicated and erased. Because Bruce Pritchard has a problem with Paul Heyman. For whatever reason, Bruce Pritchard has a problem with Paul Heyman. And now Paul Heyman's back on television and he's in the middle of the biggest storylines on SmackDown in WWE, I should say, all of WWE. He's with the face of the company, writing storylines, molding Reigns into the performer that he is today, still in a creative role. And what Paul Heyman is doing away from creative of SmackDown, he's doing creatively with Roman and everything that he's doing with Roman is putting Bruce to shame. This is why Bruce can't stand Paul Heyman. There's something there. Whether Bruce doesn't think that Paul Heyman is uh, is good enough to be a McMahon or mingling with the McMahons. He's an outsider. He always looked at Paul Heyman as an outsider. I don't know what it is. But Paul Heyman came in and was doing right. He had the right vision. Whether his vision was being implemented remains to be seen. Nobody knows. Because that show is always run by Vince. But Bruce comes in and he felt threatened by Paul Heyman. And the way to get back at Paul Heyman, ha ha ha, you're gone. Vince got rid of you. Now I'm here. Now I'm going to get rid of everything that you did because I don't need you and your, your ideas. This is my show now. If what you did on this show was going to get over, it's going to make me look bad. So fuck it. And this is the political rhetoric that Bruce Pritchard instills backstage. This Burial of Andrade and Aleister Black is a Bruce Pritchard practice. It is a political advantage that Bruce Pritchard holds over everybody. And if Aleister and Andrade got over, that would be against Bruce. That would be for Paul. This is Paul's vision. So Bruce wants nothing to do with whatever Paul Heyman had as far as the vision goes. It sucks. And Aleister Black is going to ride out his contract. If they don't use him, he's gone. He may be mentally gone right now. He's just waiting for that 90-day non-compete to kick in. If, when they release him, or if they release him, or he's just going to ride it out. Then WWE would be slick and, hey man, you want to resign for another five years? Motherfucker, you kept me off TV for two and a half fucking years and ruined a great thing that I had in NXT. I asked to go back down to NXT. You didn't fucking give me the option to go down. The fuck do I want to be with you guys for? He's probably just sitting at home with his wife having a good time, drinking a cold beverage. And he's doing what he's got to do, waiting out his contract to expire. Goodbye. Back to New Japan you go. Or to New Japan you go. To AEW you go. Maybe his contract runs out. Zelina signs with AEW. He goes to AEW. Maybe they pair them as a couple. Tommy End and Thea Trinidad on AEW television. The world may see that happen sooner rather than later, folks. Fuck Bruce Bridget. Dynamite. Dynamite beats NXT. AEW and NXT were up in total viewers. AEW took the win this week as well as the win in the key demos of 18 to 49. Dynamite drew 747,000 live viewers and NXT did 713,000 live viewers. Last week, AEW did 741 and NXT did 558. NXT was coming off a very good TakeOver Vengeance Day special. The top 150 shows on cable were not released. So we don't know where either show ranked, but NXT was up because of the great takeover that they did on Valentine's Day. Probably the best takeover since NXT TakeOver Portland. It was a great show. I covered it. You guys missed the live stream. It's on the channel. Go and check it out. But the reason why they were up is because of the fallout and what happened with Adam Cole. Everybody was wondering what 
is going to happen with the Undisputed Era. AEW, they got a major pay-per-view coming up in a couple of weeks. They got that big Shaquille O'Neal match with Cody Rhodes coming up in a couple of weeks. I don't know why they aren't drawing higher. I don't know why the ratings on Wednesday nights are as low as they are. I don't know why people continue to bicker back and forth and banter back and forth about the rating. Who gives a shit about the fucking ratings? Who gives a shit about the ratings? These are not even the overall real ratings. You're not even factoring in DVR and how many people are not watching on Wednesday and opt to watch on a Thursday like I do on the WWE Network when it comes to NXT, or commercial free, by the way, and AEW, who doesn't watch on a Thursday or a Friday or, or whatever, Saturday when they get to it. How do you know what else is being factored into those ratings? Both shows may be higher than they are on national television on USA and TNT. But what is the fucking bickering and, and banter back and forth? Who gives a fuck? Still to this day, we're arguing about ratings. Nobody gives a fuck anymore. If one show is better than the other, we say it. I say it. I've said countless times NXT was a better show than AEW on any given week. I'm not afraid to admit when NXT has a good show. Enough with the fucking banter back and forth about the ratings. Nobody cares. 18 to 49. AEW did a 0.31. And NXT did a 0.16. Adam Page and Matt Hardy beat the Hybrid 2. Jack Evans and Angelico. The Young Bucks defeated Santana and Ortiz to retain the AEW Tag Team titles. FTR defeated Matt and Mike Seidel. Didn't even know there was a Mike Seidel before Dynamite. But he was there. Orange Cassidy defeated Dr. Luther. Riho made her United States AEW return, defeating Serena Deeb in the AEW Women's Eliminator Tournament. She now goes on to wrestle Thunder Rosa in the second round of that tournament. Should be a great match. Very good match. Probably the best match of the entire night between Deeb and Riho. John Moxley, Lance Archer, and Ray Phoenix defeated Eddie Kingston, Butcher, and Blade with the major announcement of AEW booking Kenny Omega challenging John Moxley to an exploding barbed wire death match for the AEW world title at Revolution. I can't wait to see all the snowflake cucks and virgins complain about this one, folks. It's going to be glorious on social media. I can't fucking wait. I can't wait. I don't know what that match is going to entail, but I said this on Wednesday night. I love it. It fits right into Moxley's wheelhouse. And Kenny Omega, we all know he's an incredible wrestler, probably either one or two, depending on who you talk to in the world. And he is going to wrestle yet another match that he's going to wrestle to perfection to show you how exactly great he really is, wrestling all different variables and styles in the world of professional wrestling. If Kenny Omega is being thrown into a match, he's going to do it. No matter the style, he's going to do it. He's going to do it to top peak physical condition and excellence. That's why I love it. Can't wait to see what happens. Exploding barbed wire death match at Revolution, folks. WWE management and their eyebrows are going to be burnt to a fucking crisp when they see what's happening. Oh, man, we can't do anything like that, but that was fucking cool. Love it. NXT, Kyle O'Reilly came out and demanded answers from Adam Cole to start the show. Got a decent promo. Nothing really all that crazy, but clearly Adam Cole no-showed after O'Reilly axed. Shotzi Blackheart and Ember Moon defeated Candice LeRae and Indy Hartwell. I don't know why Shotzi and Ember are still teaming up. I'm imagining maybe that Ember Moon is growing boring to some people and a heel turn might be necessary. A heel turn might be in the cards for Ember against Shotzi. So we'll see what happens. Leon Ruff defeated Isaiah Swerve Scott. Swerve Scott turned heel. Ruff won with a crucifix roll-up. Stunning Mr. Swerve. After the match, Scott beat down on Leon Ruff. Viciously launching him into the turnbuckle. Turning heel in the process. So there you go. Swerve wants a North American Championship title shot. So he may be moving on from that cruiserweights-esque vibe. So we'll see what happens. Why Leon Ruff is still on television, I have no idea, man. I look at him and I just look at NXT becoming a joke. That man was North American champion. Leon Ruff. 
Awful. Casey Conzaro, Caden Carter. They defeated Aaliyah and Jesse Kamea. Casey Cottonzaro and Caden Carter, they were celebrating and it was short-lived. Zaya Lee showed up and confronted Cottonzaro, marking her hand in cryptic fashion about this 1,000-year-old entity that is controlling Zaya Lee and Boa. I love the presentation, but I'm not here to make believe that someone is 1,000 years old on NXT television. Just give me who the fuck it is already so we can move on. But the presentation of Zia Lee is awesome. Awesome. Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler showed up to confront Raquel Gonzalez in Dakota Kai. So Nia Jax and her whole showed up on television on Wednesday night. Seen a lot of people bantering back and forth on social media. I love how I have to be school teacher to everybody. But aren't Naomi and Lana deserve the title match first? Yes, they are. But this is a situation where bending of the rules are needed. Listen, geeks, class is in session. Get out your pencils, get out your pads, get out your fucking uh, calculators, whatever you got there in your, in your, your book bag, right? Sit down, shut your mouth. Teacher's about to open up a can of fucking knowledge whoop ass on you. Naomi and Lana are, are, are definitely getting a, a championship match, okay? But the thing is, why on fucking planet Earth, or any planet for that matter, why would you give Lana and Naomi a needed win? Because if you pair Naomi and Lana, who beat the champions in a non-title match, they, they are owed a tag team title match. Why would you book them to win the titles from Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler to ultimately be the ones to go down to NXT to confront Raquel and Dakota Kai? I'm going to stop right there. Okay. NXT is obviously not the same show. Do you want to make it worse? Do you want Lana back in NXT or back? Do you want, actually, I guess you could say back in NXT because she was there with Rusev. Do you want Lana back, this current Lana back in NXT? Do you want Lana on NXT television? Lana on NXT television is a, a complete opposite of what that show should be embodying. Lana is awful. Why do you want Lana on television on Wednesday night? Naomi's good. But I don't want to see Naomi in this tag team with Lana anyway. I don't want to see them on Wednesday night challenging Raquel and Dakota Kai. That match just sounds awful. So what should you do? You have Nia and Shayna show up on Wednesday night. They're the ones who lose the titles to Raquel and Dakota, and rightfully so. Then you have that match happen on Wednesday night, which Shayna is Miss NXT. She held... That women's title several times. The most dominant female besides Asuka on that entire brand in the history of NXT. Nia Jax. I mean, just the pairing of Nia Jax and Raquel Gonzalez is enough to sell me over a Naomi and Lana. So you have Raquel and Dakota beat Nia Jax and Shayna on NXT television. They are the new women's champions. Then you have Raquel and Dakota go to Monday Night Raw and defend those titles against Lana and Naomi. And then you have the NXT girl show up on Monday night, which is a lot better than Lana showing up on Wednesday night. You have these two women show up on Monday and beat the holy hell out of Naomi and Lana. And then they take the tag team titles back to NXT where they belong because that division is fucking absolutely bursting at the seams. They got so many women down there. They don't know what to fucking do with them. The titles should be on NXT because all these makeshift tag teams on Monday and Friday night, they ain't doing anything for Shayna, Nia, or whoever holds those tag team titles. They are absolutely needed in NXT. Not because of the division itself, but that's where women's wrestling is the hottest right now. Again, why would you want Lana and Naomi on Wednesday night challenging anybody? Raquel and Dakota on Monday is the way to go. It's fresh, it's new, it's exciting. You get those two women who are awesome in front of new eyes, a new audience. They get to see Raquel and how, sh how great she is and how great Dakota Kai is. This is the right way to go about it. I don't know. I don't know why anybody can't think for themselves on this situation. Class dismissed. Class dismissed. And there's no extra credit. 
I'm giving you all an F. Kushida defeated Tyler Rust. Apparently Malcolm Bivens made Bivens, or Rust rather, forfeit via Malcolm Bivens' forfeit, whatever. Rust seems like a jobber. He looked good for the first couple of times I saw him, but he looks like a jobber. I don't know what they got planned for him, but whatever. Zoe Stark defeated Valentina Faraz. Zoe Stark, very intense, very intense, I would say. Nice little showing here. She looks kind of generic, but she got the victory. Shawn Michaels tweeted out, he's very excited about her future. So if Shawn Michaels is tweeting about Zoe Stark, who they just signed to the WWE, then I guess you're in good hands. Pete Dunne, Oni Lorcan, and Danny Burch defeated Finn Balor, Kyle O'Reilly, Roderick Strong in a six-man tag team match. It was not even about the match. It was what happened after the match, folks. And this is where the news comes in. His backstage reaction to what happened on NXT after they cut an angle and social media went crazy. Kyle O'Reilly not only had fans worried, but those in WWE NXT following the stretcher angle after Wednesday night had all of its fans and locker room worried about what was happening with Kyle O'Reilly. While working the main event, Adam Cole kicked him in the head and then hit a brain buster onto the steel steps. Medics were checking on him. As the show came to a close, a fan in attendance of the show got people really concerned as they had claimed O'Reilly suffered a seizure and was taken out of the building on a stretcher. I'm going to stop right there before I move on to what Fightful is reporting about Kyle O'Reilly. First of all, I watched the angle that happened on Wednesday night and I seen the footage or the still pictures or, or, or whatever happened after the camera stopped rolling, Okay. What I watched on TV was a man doing his job. I replayed the kick from Adam Cole several times. Safe as ever is Adam Cole. Kicked him in the head. Delivered a very safe looking brain buster. Usually I would say, oh my God. What the fuck was that? Very safe kicks. Very safe brain buster. Kyle O'Reilly was laying there as if he was dead to the fucking planet. Okay. So you got this fucking idiot, and I hope you're listening to me, you fucking geek, who was allowed inside Full Sail University. I hope you're listening to me, whoever you are. You got this fucking idiot who is in, not Full Sail, but the Capitol Wrestling Center, the Performance Center, taking pictures and videos, and he's putting it out there in the universe on social media that Kyle O'Reilly suffered a seizure. And WWE had to have him stretched away, and Triple H was out there, and Medical personnel were out there and everybody was concerned. Nobody knew what was going on. I would love for someone to come to me and explain to me when and where WWE ever said anything about Kyle O'Reilly having a seizure. Why was Kyle O'Reilly and seizure in the same fucking sentence, in the same statement on social media? Are you a medical professional? Are you a fucking doctor? Do you have your PhD? How the fuck are you going to go on social media and say someone is having a seizure when nobody mentioned the fucking seizure? I don't get it. So what this resulted in was everybody freaking out on social media. You got one idiot looking to drop a big scoop to get himself some followers on social media by making up some bullshit to get everybody scared. Let me tell you something, motherfucker. You got work. You got bamboozled. Kyle O'Reilly, Adam Cole, Triple H, and everybody in NXT that facilitated this angle worked you to fucking death. And I love it. You know what I saw when I watched this angle, folks, and when I watched all this happening at the end of it? I saw Kyle O'Reilly doing his job to perfection. That's what I saw. I saw Triple H working everybody, even his own locker room, because that's what somebody's going to do to generate interest. This is not like leaking some fucking result at a tape show. This is not like desperately booking against AEW. This is Triple H using the oldest tactic in the book. Let me work the fucking fans to generate interest 
with a pro wrestling storyline. And it worked to better than perfection. Kyle O'Reilly is fine. There's nothing wrong with Kyle O'Reilly. He didn't suffer a seizure. He didn't go through withdrawals. He's not suffering from his illness, his diabetes. It's not, nothing, nothing along those lines. It's all a part of the show. But this fucking idiot wanted to cut a scoop or break news, and he got everybody worried. Feifel's reporting that due to O'Reilly's history with diabetes, the angle caused a lot of concern amongst even the NXT roster who weren't sure if the situation was real or not. It's none of their business. They're not involved in the storyline. Triple H worked even them to keep it at the level he needed to keep it at. If everybody knew, then you wouldn't have got the reaction that you got. And that reaction was golden. It was pointed out how WWE not telling most of their roster about creative, including injury angles, isn't out of the ordinary. Also, a person in the company stated that this was not a seizure storyline as WWE never made mention about it when the idea for the angle was pitched or executed. But according to this geek in attendance at the CWC, it was a seizure. When WWE realized how the angle had gotten so out of hand due to the fan falsely stating O'Reilly had a seizure, they sent word out that it's just a storyline and Kyle O'Reilly retweeted about it Thursday. Clearly, WWE is building towards a match between Cole and O'Reilly. However, there's no word yet on when that match will take place. Fuck it. Do it at WrestleMania. Do it at WrestleMania. Have O'Reilly beat Cole at WrestleMania. Give me two WrestleMania matches this year from NXT. Cole and O'Reilly, Balor and Cross. There you go. Or maybe you do Balor, O'Reilly, Cross, and Cole in a fatal four-way. I don't know. I don't know. They got a myriad of ideas they could do. But NXT needs to be represented at WrestleMania. But the backstage reaction, folks, it got over. O'Reilly did his job. Cole did his job. The fan did not. Put your phone away and stop acting like a medical professional, you fucking geek. Nowhere did WWE say this was a seizure storyline. Karrion Cross, he was supposed to wrestle Santos Escobar on Wednesday, but it didn't happen. Meltzer actually talked about this and said, and I quote, there was a medical reason that I heard on Tuesday that the match wasn't going to take place. It's not a storyline. It was a storyline out of necessity and not a planned storyline. William Regal did a video segment where he announced the match for next week, and if Escobar doesn't show up, and work the match, he would be stripped of his cruiserweight title as well as be suspended. So it's happening. I don't know why. I still don't know why Cross is feuding with Escobar. This is just an interim before Cross moves on to the world title, I assume. The match was supposed to happen on Wednesday, but obviously they announced it for next week. And WWE is filming new content for a new NXT show. Back in November, it was reported that Triple H had been going through budgets to try and find a way to implement some type of new show that would get more NXT talent in ring time and exposure. In December, it was revealed that the executive of NXT, the head executive of NXT, I should say, had created a team to oversee this new NXT show with the idea that it would be a minor league system for NXT, the way NXT was to Monday Night Raw and SmackDown Many years ago. Now it's not that way because they need to be TV ready, primed for TV because they're competing with AEW. So WWE had this with Evolve. Evolve was the feeder system for NXT. NXT was a feeder system for on SmackDown. Now NXT is not a feeder system anymore. Now it's going to be this show. This show is going to be a feeder system to NXT. So they bought Evolve. Evolve. They all kind of merged with NXT. Gabe Sapolsky came over. They signed a bunch of talent. He's been the head booker of Evolve, Gabe, and now will be leading this team on this new show. Fightful, Select, and Sean Ross Sapp reported that WWE has filmed content for a second NXT series that will tentatively be called NXT Evolve. It was also noted that the graphics and a title belt have been made with branding, but that could all change. Dan Beltzer, apparently he makes belts or is in the know with belts, had mentioned a few days ago that he also heard of a new belt being made. It was said that Gabe Sapolsky and Jeremy Borash are heavily involved with the production, which is nothing like anything else 
WWE has done up until this point. The tapings were hosted in the warehouse that WWE used as the Performance Center during COVID-19 before creating the Thunderdome. Josiah Williams was the host, which has a fight feeling to it. It should be noted that there was no live commentary, but that could be added in post-production. Who's going to be handling the commentary? I don't know. Wishing upon a star. Hopefully they bring Moro Ronaldo back. But we'll see what happens. I, I think this is great. I'm excited about this, man. As long as it's on the WWE Network, I'm there. And it may actually reinvigorate me to fall in love with NXT again. If NXT is not going to be able to deliver NXT like it was delivering NXT to us two or three years ago, maybe this is a replacement for that. Because I've fallen out of love with NXT. I still watch it, but I don't feel the same way about the show as I did. Morrow's not there. He took a piece of NXT with him when he left. Commentary team is terrible. Wade Barrett's good, but I don't give a shit about that commentary team. The, the Thunderdome look to the CWC doesn't work for me. Storylines aren't there. It's not as good as it used to be. It's very Monday Night Raw-esque. More times than I care to realize. It's very main roster-esque. They're acting main roster-esque on Wednesday nights to compete with AEW. So if this is a way to get me to fall in love with NXT and the NXT process again, then I'm all for it. Very much looking forward to seeing what they got. New show, new belt, new roster. Sign me up, man. I think that sounds exciting. Monday Night Raw ratings for this week. They were down. They were down. What else is new? The show was awful. The show sucks. The episode drew an average of 1.810 million viewers. This is actually up from the 1.715 million the show did a week ago. Hour one did a 1.935. Hour two did a 1.806. And hour three did a 1.690. The 18 to 49 demo saw hour one do a 0.60, 0.57 in hour two, and 0.53 in hour three. It was a gauntlet match for the final spot in the Elimination Chamber on Sunday for the Raw WWE title. Sheamus won that. Drew McIntyre got pinned. Oh, but Drew McIntyre looked good in defeat. No, he didn't. He lost. The WWE champion lost in a match that will have no direct effect on what happens at WrestleMania. So you just gave your WWE champion a loss for no reason. On Monday night. A match, by the way, that Sheamus is not winning. He's coming in at number six. He's not winning. Who the fuck knows who's going to be in there when he comes out at number six? The entire fucking field could be filled without being eliminated. So what sense does it make to have Drew McIntyre lose? I don't get it. Matt Riddle and Lucha House Party defeated the Hurt Business. I got news on that. Kofi Kingston defeated the Miz. Miz gave up his spot in the elimination chamber. Went to Kofi. Don't know why they didn't sell the story on Kofi and Ali. Because Kofi took Ali's spot in the chamber a couple of years back. I don't know why they didn't go back to that. But The Miz, fucking guys all over this show, man. And it's not good. Shayna Baszler defeated Lana, Charlotte and Asuka. Lacey Evans and Peyton Royce went to a no contest when referee didn't make a decision. Lacey Evans just backs out of the ring and doesn't want anything to do with Charlotte. Announces that she's pregnant. You got Ric Flair dancing around, strutting around like the child is his. She's legitimately pregnant. Goodbye. Nine months without Lacey on TV, that makes for a better raw viewing experience. No question. Keith Lee. Got news on Keith Lee here. First of all, his status on the Elimination Chamber is up in the air. Nobody knows what's going on with Keith Lee. He wasn't on the show. And according to Meltzer... From Wrestling Observer Radio, Lee wasn't on Monday's episode of Raw. It's possible that if Lee can't make the show, then WWE would have Lashley versus Riddle in a one-on-one match for the United States title. There's no word yet on what kept Lee off of television. Mia Yim had COVID. She was out. So Keith Lee was out because of that. So I don't know why he's out again. Maybe it's just WWE looking at Keith Lee and saying, you know what? We're going to stop forcing This Keith Lee thing, we don't see nothing in him. We're just going to put him on main event. Him and Ricochet can become best friends in fucking catering. Nobody knows. There's no word yet on why Lee was off Monday Night Raw after they built up Lee, Lashley, and Riddle for the United States title. 
They even announced the triple threat match for the Elimination Chamber match on Sunday. So with Lee, says Melter, something is going on with Keith Lee, who also wasn't on the show on Monday, and we don't know whether he's going to be at the Elimination Chamber. We don't know what's going on outside the two chamber matches. The Lashley match, which was a three-way we don't know if Lee will be in that match or not. It's up in the air right now, so it might just be Lashley and Riddle in a singles match again. I don't know. I don't really know. Then I come to find out that there is a report, an exclusive from Ringside News, where Keith Lee is receiving pushback from WWE higher-ups, and Vince McMahon doesn't see that spark in Keith Lee. Now, Keith Lee, obviously, we all know how he came onto the scene on Monday night. He walked in limitless, and he walked out on night one buried. You don't agree with that statement? Blow me. Ringside News has learned that there is currently pushback on Keith Lee because of Vince McMahon. Lee, obviously, we all know how great he can be. We all know that he's athletic. We know for a guy his size, he's incredibly athletic and gifted. But apparently there's no spark in Vince McMahon's eye. Vince McMahon sees nothing in Keith Lee. One tenured writer close to the situation confirmed to us at Ringside News that Keith Lee's promos have not caught on fire. Then again, it was also explained to us that nobody's really excelling in that area apart from Roman Reigns, Paul Heyman, Randy Orton, Edge, the Street Profits. And then they mentioned Lacey Evans. I don't know who's a fan of Lacey Evans' promos, but they are absolutely an abomination. The whole thing, the whole gimmick is forced. So the whole accent is just forced. Yet somebody is latching on to that, but not Keith Lee. I guess the blonde hair goes a long way, man. Maybe Keith Lee should put on a fucking blonde wig. Keith Lee was one of the people who Vince McMahon handpicked to go back to the Performance Center to take big men classes. He obviously believes that Keith Lee needs a bit more tuning up. So Keith Lee, right now, we all have this feeling about Keith Lee that is being wasted. And nobody knows what he's doing at the Elimination Chamber. They exclusively reported Ringside News, like I mentioned in the first half of the show, that the card is still a work in progress. Lee was supposed to be part of the United States title match against Lee. It was supposed to be Lee, Riddle, and Lashley, but that's up in the air as of right now. Folks, why is there pushback when it comes to Keith Lee? Why is there pushback when it comes to Keith Lee? I, I mentioned this and it's no secret. Keith Lee, in the simplest way for me to put it, if you are Vince McMahon and Vince McMahon looks at somebody like Keith Lee, Vince McMahon is thinking one thing and one thing only. This guy is fat. This guy's a fat black man and he's not getting over. Let's see how well he does in the ring. He doesn't work the style that I like for a big guy. Vince McMahon's got it in his mind that Keith Lee's got to work like fucking Big Show or Kane all of a sudden. Then you get a microphone in front of him. You put him in front of a camera. I don't know whether he is reading a fucking story or narrating a fucking tale or he's cutting a promo on a pro wrestler. WWE has absolutely fucking buried Keith Lee. And this is similar to Aleister Black's situation. You've taken somebody that was given all of the tools to succeed in NXT. He had a vibe to him. They had a vibe to them in NXT that worked. There's no reason why you should look at both of these guys, take them from NXT, put them on Monday Night Raw, and feel the need to change something about them. There's something internally going on that I just can't put my finger on. And I got a hunch as to what it is. These people want to see people like this called up from NXT that are just brimming with potential fail. Because they did not have a hand in creating that up and coming superstar. And they feel like if they break it down and mold it into their image of what they want it to be, and it succeeds, then Triple H is the one that fails. And that they are right, and that they are creatively superior. How many people 
Just think about it. How many people can come up from NXT and legitimately succeed if Triple H is churning out the future one after the other like it was a fucking production factory, right? And every one of them succeeded. How do you think that's going to make Vince McMahon and Bruce Pritchard look? How do you think that's going to make main roster etiquette look? This guy's doing it right. Triple H is doing it right. But Vince McMahon, he hasn't made a new star since John Cena left. Meanwhile, Triple H is churning out all these potential futures, future pieces of the company. Don't you think that's a little against Vince McMahon? Don't you think Vince McMahon would look at that and say, whoa, 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 whoa. You're making me look bad here. I can't look bad. You're the one that's inferior to me. So Alistair Black and Keith Lee have now paid the ultimate price. It sucks. But Keith Lee, he doesn't even feel the same. He doesn't look the same. He doesn't sound the same. And this is going back to well before he was even called up. He does not look the same. He doesn't feel the same. He doesn't sound the same. He sounds awful. He sounds forced. Everything he sounds like, it's just, he's just spitting words out with no fucking meaning. There's nothing to personally latch onto. There's no investment there. Then you want to change his in-ring style. The reason why we fell in love with him was because he was a big guy that could fucking do things that a big guy shouldn't do. Yeah, you want to put him back down at the performance center and then you want to mold him into the next fucking cane. I don't want to see, I don't want to see Keith Lee doing, I don't want to see none of that. I want to see Keith Lee in the ring diving over ropes. I want to see Keith Lee Spanish flying off the top rope. I want to see Keith Lee pouncing people into the fucking eighth row. I want to see a guy that played football throw people around and fly around because he's not supposed to do that. And who the fuck are you to say that Keith Lee is not getting over based on his promos? His promos not, might not be good, but you're not helping the fucking cause with the goddamn Thunderdome. How the fuck do you know if Keith Lee is over or not if, get this, Bruce and Vince, there's no live audience. You expect them to just magically get over in front of virtual fucking geeks and the Thunderdome? You control everything. The only thing that you see is what you've Buried Keith Lee as a result. Everything that you're seeing is your doing. You've ruined him. What you're watching on television is your doing here. Yet you want to blame Keith Lee. I, I Vince doesn't see the spark in Keith Lee. I wonder why. You yourself killed the fucking spark. Meanwhile, everybody that knows this guy and sees this guy still has that spark. Vince is never going to find his top guy if this is the process of how things happen from NXT to the main roster. Awful. Pushback. Why? Why? Because he's fat and it doesn't work the style that you want and he comes off overly forced. That's why. And what I said about NXT and the main roster and the discrepancy there. Something's going on that we just don't have a real solid answer to. But I know I know. Damian Priest. Fightful is reporting that Damian Priest was extremely well-liked backstage since his call-up. And he's turning heads both during his Rumble appearance and his Raw appearances with Bad Bunny. One employee told the media outlet and Sean Ross Sapp that Priest was given a full plate across both nights, Rumble and Raw, and did everything they could have expected from him after being thrown into the deep end. And that's not the only time we've seen that, folks. That's not the only time we heard that, heard that as well. Remember when Vince McMahon called up Alistair Black, Ricochet, Tommaso Ciampa, and Johnny Gargano? And the reason why he did it was he wanted to think outside the box. There was no plans for them. And Vince's thinking was he's going to take Triple H's top four guys in that year, put them on Raw with no plans, and Vince's mentality is, I want to see who sinks and I want to see who swims. That's the same mentality he had then. He did the same thing with Priest. But Priest ended up swimming. So he's in good hands, apparently right now. They paired him with Bad Bunny. He's probably going to get a WrestleMania match out of it. Good for Damian Priest. He's a Bronx guy. Got to support my Bronx guys. So good for him. Not really totally excited about Morrison and Miz mixing up with Damian Priest. So we're going to have to wait to really get the real Priest when he's not feuding with Miz and Morrison, 
on Monday Night Raw. But knowing WWE and how they do things, this will be a feud for the next eight months. We'll be coming up to the Survivor Series and these two, these three guys will still be feuding. And finally, guys, MVP. He was legitimately injured on Monday Night Raw. And it was in that six-man tag with Matt Riddle and the Lucha House Party. Meltzer talked about MVP suffering an injury during that six-man tag on The Observer Radio. He says, and I quote, did you see MVP blow out his knee? I don't know how serious it was. He either took, and I don't think it was from this, he either took a bump off the apron, landed on his feet, and then he gets into the ring. It seems like he was walking in the ring and his knee just went out. It didn't play into the match. He was limping. They were helping him to the back when they took the cameras off of him. But when the camera was on him, he was trying to walk on his own and gut it out and not sell it. It was very similar Remember when Kevin Nash tore his quad? Yeah, it was a very similar look. You know, you just take a step and all of a sudden, boom. I don't know for sure if it was a knee, but he was limping pretty bad. He's hurt, and I don't know the extent of the injury. I don't know if it's a serious injury or if he just tweaked it, but he got hurt in the later stages of that match. Then there was a follow-up. Meltzer, the very next day, the very next day, on Tuesday night, he talked about MVP needing some assistance to the back, PW Insider dug deep into this story and they reported on top of what Meltzer reported that MVP is hurt. He flew to Birmingham, Alabama to see a specialist and when wrestlers travel to Birmingham, Alabama, it usually means surgery is needed. And they're going to be out a very long time. Now, this is not confirmed by WWE in any way, but MVP showed up on Raw Talk on crutches. So he's legitimately hurt. I, I don't understand. First of all, I, I feel terrible for, for MVP. The Hurt Business has been, for the better part of the last year, some of the best things about Monday Night Raw. And that is on a list that is very, very short. But MVP has legitimately turned Bobby Lashley, Sheldon Benjamin, and Cedric Alexander's careers around. And he's a great presence and a great mouthpiece for that group. If he's not going to be with them on television, that's going to hurt them. And ultimately, maybe WWE is contemplating breaking them up now with MVP going to be out for nine months if it's a knee injury. Imagine he tore an ACL, an MCL, or whatever. Done. So we don't know what is right now looming over the Hurt Business. But I have to question, why are we using MVP on Raw? Why is MVP wrestling on Monday Night Raw to even put him in a position to get this injury in the first place? You have an entire roster of people that you could be using, yet we're still in 2021 using MVP in a wrestling capacity when we all know his value right now is as a mouthpiece for the Hurt Business. So why is he wrestling? WWE has nobody to blame but themselves. And I know shit happens. MVP will probably tell you that's the nature of the business. Comes with the territory. But you didn't need to be put in that situation to begin with. You might be looking at a healthy MVP. Anyway, guys, I'm getting out of here. That is everything I got. This Elimination Chamber off the script, episode 365. If you enjoyed the video, hit that thumbs up. Make sure you guys hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on the bell. For all notifications, go and get your t-shirts, bonfire.com. Link is down below. Get your masks, mouthmasker.com slash OTS. Go check out the Patreon page, patreon.com slash JD from NY206. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at JD from NY206. Go check out all the other videos that you might have missed on the channel. Monday Night Raw, AEW, Friday Night, SmackDown, live streams. Everything you need is linked in the description below. And as always... Hit that subscribe button, like I said, and turn on the bell for all notifications. Guys, I will see you on Sunday night for the Elimination Chamber live stream post show right here on OTS. Until then, I will see you on Sunday night. Have a great weekend. And please, like I said, hit that subscribe button for more. Stay up to date on everything you need in the world of WWE right here on OTS. See you guys later.